Hello and welcome to Magic Concepts, the series where we explore different Magic the Gathering concepts, starting from zero base knowledge in the game and going all the way through pro tour level strategies. Today, we are going to be covering mid range decks, finding the balance between both the control and aggro strategies. So in the last few videos, we've gone over what comprises an aggressive or aggro strategy, uh, how to make proper decisions in a control deck, and now we're going to cover the third major archetype in Magic with the mid-range deck. Now your mid-range strategy tends to utilize early game defense, which can stall out the aggro decks enough to get into the later game where the mid-range strategy can shine or sometimes just use a mana ramp to vault ahead and just outclass the smaller aggro creatures. However, because the mid-range deck does like to function in that later game, it can often get shut down by control decks that, quite frankly, just do it better. So as we said, your mid-range strategy is going to be a combination of both your aggro and control strategies. Uh, built with both offense and defense in mind, this jack-of-all-trades building strategy leaves your mid-range deck with the ability to adapt to almost any situation or board state. Uh, these decks often feature a mix of both creature and non-creature spells, uh, while your aggro or control decks typically focus on one or the other. In the early game, your mid-range decks are generally able to match the aggro tempo through blockers or targeted removal for key threats. And in the late game, your mid-range deck will generally have multiple ways of taking over and closing out the game. Some of them build from multiple interactions throughout the entire early game, uh, whereas others simply just play huge beatdown threats on their own right. Uh, the deck we're looking at today is going to be more of the latter. So while your aggroed creatures focus on dealing damage and your control creatures focus on closing out the game, mid-range creatures tend to focus more on adaptability. Uh, creatures that function equally both on the offense and the defense. So a versatile creature like Tranquil Thrillbrack aside from being just a body on the battlefield, can also function as removal for artifacts or enchantments, graveyard disruption to foil opponent recursion, or even life gain to counter your opponent's initial aggressive assault. Uh, this kind of versatility to both attack and push through damage if you're ahead of the board, or threaten a block to stall out an aggressive deck, is what lets the mid-range deck adapt to an ever-changing board state. Even the mid-range deck's late-game finishers, like a seismic monstrosaur, can function defensively as well. Uh, first, by simply being a big body to block with, but also maintaining the versatility to find a land in the early game, or to draw more cards in the late game. Even the deck's removal spells need to be versatile enough to be used on either offense or defense. Trumpeting Carnosaur, for example, is a great offensive threat, but also can be used as a defensive kill spell in a pinch if we need it to. So every deck needs to have their mana base, their mana curve, and tempo in mind when they build their deck, and mid-range is no exception. However, they need the additional consideration of having their early plays still being viable in the late game as well. So as we see with aggro decks, early creatures can often get outclassed by bigger creatures later on. I mean, that's the whole strategy of the mid-range deck against an aggro deck to begin with. So in order to keep mid-range creatures viable in the late game, they have to have some way to stay in the fight. Uh, some have different abilities like the ability to pump themselves up or like Poison Dart Frog can get Death Touch 
to make these early creatures into late game threats, especially on the defense. Uh, other options for mid range deck early plays is either removal spells or interaction spells that can interrupt your opponent's early tempo plays. Alternatively, the mid range deck can look to focus their early game simply on ramping their mana to get into their late game threats and make those larger creatures that are going to turn the game in their favor. Mana ramp does have an initial tempo investment, however, of playing a card that doesn't necessarily improve your board state, uh, which could let aggressive decks push through more damage than you can handle. Uh, for example, with Topiary Stomper, yes, you ramp into an additional land to get into your bigger threats sooner, but he cannot attack or block unless you control seven or more lands. So until you get to that late game, he doesn't really exist. But that payout of finding additional lands or being able to generate additional mana like the Dart Frog can help you put down bigger creatures faster to help stop your opponent's onslaught entirely. Another hidden benefit, maybe, to Mana Ramp is that it not only lets your deck support more bigger creatures to help finish off your opponent, but also sometimes it can let you reduce the land count in your deck, which will help give your deck more live draws to draw into more action later on in the end game because you've thinned out the lands in your deck and so you're no longer drawing into as many in the late game. Now, because the mid-range deck wants to play in the late game, there has to be some consideration taken towards card advantage as well. But just like interaction cards, the card advantage needs to maintain the versatility of either being an effect on a stick, essentially, um, a kill spell with a creature attached to it, or by utilizing virtual card advantage. A card like Bone Horde Dracosaur achieves this virtual card advantage uh, first by exiling the top of your deck, but still letting you cast those cards, essentially as if they were in your hand in addition to adding token cards on the battlefield whenever you do. So you either get a dinosaur creature token or a treasure token that you can use as mana ramp. Another common way that mid-range decks manipulate card advantage other than simply drawing extra cards is by playing huge creatures. So a large creature like Earthshaker Dreadmaw can effectively blank your opponent's smaller creatures because a 2-2 attacker is not going to attack into a 6-6 Dreadmaw. It will die and not have any effect on the board at all. Also, having higher toughness, uh, typically over 3, can effectively blank a lot of spot removal spells, such as a shock spell that deals 2 damage or a lightning strike that deals 3 damage. And at the very least, this higher toughness can cause a situation where an opponent has to use two or more cards to deal with your threat, uh, causing a default two-for-one exchange. So if they have to use two lightning strikes to kill your Dreadmaw, your one card took out two of your opponent's cards. Or if they attack in and have to use a pump spell just to get rid of it, then they're also using two of their cards to get rid of one of yours. And so this two-for-one exchange is a source of virtual card advantage for you, even if your creature does die immediately. Eventually, however, you will have to look towards ending the game. Yes, ramping into your big creatures is great, but if all you do is sit on your side of the battlefield and wait, then you're not really doing much. The mid-range decks typically do not have that inevitability that the control decks have, so you do have to kill your opponent eventually. And so it's important to know when is the right time to attack. This point where you turn your flexibility against your opponent and start going from defense to offense is known as turning the corner. So when you cast your big flexible beatdown spells like Atali Primal Conqueror, uh, that's typically when you're going to turn that corner 
and you are going to use your big creatures to just overwhelm your opponents. You're going to use any removal spells you have at your disposal to get rid of potential blockers. You're going to use that flexibility and versatility that has been on defense this entire game. And when you turn that corner, you're going to turn that into an attack that will just decimate your opponent in either one or two turns and just close the game out. So once again, to recap, uh, the keys to building or even modifying your mid-range decks, uh, most importantly, you want to keep your cards versatile. You want to ensure that your creatures and your spells are good for both offense and defense. You need to include a top end that is still versatile enough to counter both aggro and control strategies. Uh, using any ramp spells to accelerate into later turns faster. And using multi-purpose removal spells that can also gain life, uh, attack your opponent if it's on a body or cause some other effects to interact with the board state to help maintain that adaptability and versatility of your deck. Your early game is going to focus on tempo and defense, eventually turning that corner into the late game where your larger board and card advantage will often overwhelm your opponent's defenses. And so, like we do in all these videos, uh, we've been talking for a while. Let's go ahead and see this deck in action. All right, I kind of like this hand. Uh, we don't really have a whole lot of ramp, but we are only one land away from Hulking Raptor, which we can get there with Monster Sword if we need to. So yeah, let's go ahead and keep this hand. Uh, we can Insquith on two. Uh, depending on what opponent does, they are getting mana. All right. Let's go ahead and drop our dino. We'll go ahead and swing out two. Next turn, I can hit the nursery. So let's do hidden nursery. I will go ahead and swing out. If he blocks, then I can chomp it post combat. If he doesn't block, then I can do two damage and I'm happy with that too. All right. The opponent's second color is blue. We saw some proliferate there. Uh, so it looks like they are on Merfolk Explore. They left Scatter Ray on top, counter, artifact, or creature spell. Alright, so let's go ahead and drop our Raptor. Might as well swing in, there's no reason not to really. All right, he's gonna, he's gonna kill my ramp. That's not very nice of him. So we're gonna Topiary Stomper instead of Lord Keeper for one very important reason. And that is so the Trampet Chomp will do more damage because I'm tired of that creature being on the field. Um, Otherwise, Lore Keeper might have been the better play here to go into Monster Sword next turn. But he does still have that counter spell in hand, I do believe. So I do want to watch out for that. So we're going to Lore Keeper Grill Badge just to get them out of my hand. Uh, we will go ahead and pay the green. Exile his graveyard, but I don't necessarily think he's on a whole lot of graveyard recursion. So I think I'm going to gain the four life.
Oh, he does care about creature cards in Graveyard, though, so maybe exiling his Graveyard would have been the better course. Another Wayfinder. All right. He's building back up. So I think we're going to go with the Hammer Skull here. Um, if he's got that counter spell, he'll be tempted to throw it out on this because it is a big body. Um, and so we are baiting that counter spell out. I unfortunately don't have four mana to spend on it. So it does get countered. But that does uh, mean that these should be good. So I'm not going to attack into that four or five. Uh, as we were talking about, big bodies blanking smaller bodies. So now I'm not attacking because he's got that 4-5 or five out there. Oh, he's got another removal spell. Alright, so he is killing the creature that can't do anything. Alright, opponent is tapped out, which means no more counter spells. They do bring a flyer back to hand, so that might prove problematic later. I get another topiary stomper. Great. Um, I think we're going to go with the Monstrosaur here. Uh, I could do Dreadmaw, but then I'll only draw two cards. Uh, Monstrosaur might be a little ambitious, but then I'll get to draw three off of the Dreadmaw. So that's what we're doing there. We're trying to make a better value play for next turn. And he is making his Gaia's Courser big enough to withstand the Monstrosaur's Assault. And he's gonna explore again to see if he can't make it into a six, seven, and he does, so Monstrosaur is not big enough anymore. It hurts, but I think I'm just going to let it through here. Um, let's go for Dreadmaw, draw three. Ooh, I do like Natali. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and hang back still. Uh, that Courser is really big, and I don't like it. So we're, we're not quite around the corner yet. We're kind of at the corner. We can kind of peek around the corner, but we haven't quite turned it yet. Cool. So he is keeping Serum Snare on top, which will bounce something. Now he's drawing it, but he has tapped out. So I think we'll go ahead and double block here. One of them will die. You know what? We'll go ahead and do it that way. Six. So yeah, still only one of them dies. All right, let's go for Broke here. So we'll cast a Tali. We will get to cast the first card off of both of our decks. Uh, for me, it's a Dart Frog. For him, it's unfortunately just an Otter. But, I mean, it makes a nice Chump Blocker, I suppose. Let's go ahead and attack with the Dreadmaw if he wants to chump block it or trade with his Spelunker. I am okay with either option. Oh, he's going going full full value on it. Um, so he's expecting some kind of combat trick. Not that I don't know what kind of combat trick I could have being all tapped out. But yeah, we'll take out the big guy. Um, not terribly worried about the flyer with the dart frog out plus it's only two damage and I've got a Natali so I think 
I'm in pretty good shape here. Uh, he can still bounce it with the Serum Snare, which is extremely stupid because then I just get to cast it again. And yeah, he's uh, basically giving up. Alright, that makes sense. So yeah, we had definitely turned the corner there at that point with Atali. Uh, because we can either attack with the 7-7 seven, seven, or we could actually have the mana to transform it into Primal Sickness, which can just straight up kill him with poison counters. So, um, yeah, definitely we were on the attack there. Uh, we had the Dart Frog to block flyers. We had a decent ground force plus another Earthshaker in hand. So with all the heavy hitters that we've got from this point on out, um, that's the, the strength in a mid-range strategy is turning that corner, having all of this late game heavy hitters uh, with your Atalis, with your Dreadmaws. I mean, I had a Dreadmaw and a Monstrosaur out, easily took care of his board. So, I mean, definitely that late game grind certainly, you know, can put your mid-range decks over the top. Alrighty, so I hope this has helped you learn more about uh, mid-range decks, the mid-range strategy in general, and how to build and play a mid-range deck yourself. Uh, basically, that early game focusing on um, tempo, uh, using targeted removal for key opposing threats, building your mana base, mana ramp if applicable, um, and keeping your cards versatile with both offense and defense in mind. Uh, so not just a body, but the ability to go with it. Uh, that ability to adapt to different situations and an ever-changing board state. Uh, kind of getting that mix of both aggro and control. Uh, making sure that your top end is big enough to stomp out aggro and to compete with control on a uh, card advantage level with the Earthshaker Dreadmaws, with the Atalis gaining advantage like that. And being able to turn the corner from defense to offense uh, kind of figuring out where that line is uh, might be different from deck to deck. But once you have got that board presence out to where you're no longer afraid of your opponent attacking in and you're able to start committing resources to attacking your opponent, then that is when you turn that corner from defense to offense. And a lot of times the game will be closed out uh, within a very few number of turns. Um, as we saw in our sample game, as soon as we got that corner fully turned, opponent recognized it, they couldn't do anything about it, and they ended up scooping immediately. Uh, so that is going to be the power of a mid-range deck, uh, surviving that early game, ramping up into that late game, and using your versatile cards to the most advantage possible. So if this video has helped you, uh, with your mid-range decks, uh, please put a like on this video and a comment down below. Uh, subscribe to this channel for more entries in this concept series, um, along with some of the other stuff that I do, along with a, my nightly stream at 10 p.m. Eastern, so you can actually check me out on Twitch uh, with the link in the description below. And I will see y'all in the next video.